It's really good to have you here again in this Nutrable MD podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brandon Lip. If you are seeking wellness, happiness, and balance in your life, you are in the right place because all of the original content is designed to expand your horizons in an unconventional way. I incorporate all my clinical knowledge from my father's 50 plus years of experience and my own 25 plus years of helping people with various needs. In the last episode, we discussed some of my observations from helping people with anxiety and depression. Today, we will talk about a subject with groundbreaking implications. I have introduced this topic to large audiences through multiple lectures and seminars. The lecture was titled, Sensitization Predisposes After Effects. Everything COVID from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective. Let's begin. Ever since the beginning of the COVID pandemic in late 2019, I have provided treatment to countless numbers of COVID and post-COVID patients in conventional scientific health systems and using techniques from traditional Chinese medicine. I've learned so much by bridging what I know through clinical and scientific research with all the teachings from the traditional Chinese medicine's perspective. I will share with you now all this information. I hope actually it will spark even further research so that we can develop new strategies to prevent people from getting sick from viral infections and even novel therapies in the future that will push boundaries within the field of medicine. Now with my original lectures concerning this subject, I always provided some brief overview of traditional Chinese medicine concepts. I will also do that here today because understanding some basics will really help you interpret what I discuss to a much deeper level. When we talk about traditional Chinese medicine, here on abbreviated as TCM, so when we talk about TCM, we often hear about the yin and the yang, qi and the blood. But what exactly are these four terms referring to? What are they? Yin is a descriptor. It's describing something that is moisturizing, lubricating, cooling, calming, anabolic, nourishing, passive, or chronic. While yang is the exact opposite of that. Yang is describing something that is drying instead of moisturizing. It's energizing. It's heating instead of cooling. It's invigorating instead of calming. It's catabolic, breaking down things, instead of anabolic. It's active instead of passive. It's transforming, and it's acute instead of chronic. So for the universe, for all the processes within this universe to occur, the yin has to balance the yang. These are two polar opposites that work in unison to allow processes to occur. When the yin and the yang are off balance, chaos occurs. Chaos in different degrees. The greater the imbalance, the greater the chaos. So if we're referring to our human bodies, every physiologic process has a yin and a yang aspect to it. And when these aspects are off balance is when chaos, when illness, disease, and pain occurs. With modern science, we have precise descriptors for all the organs and physiologic processes that occur every second within our human body. With TCM, there is poetic descriptors like yin and yang and organ system names that basically describes all the exact same functions within our understanding of the human body from the modern scientific point of view. For example, I mentioned in the previous episode that in TCM, the liver organ system working in conjunction with the kidney organ system is essentially analogous to the endocrine system, the hormonal system as we understand it from modern medicine. Vitamin C is a yin substance. Vitamin D is a yang substance. Estrogen is a yin substance. A woman's menstrual cycle 
conception, and the pregnancy state goes through yin and yang phases from the beginning to the end. How about qi and blood? Qi, spelled Q-I, is a type of vital energy that functions to promote, to warm, to defend, to retain, to consolidate, or to transform. So think of qi as a type of energy. It's a type of energy that in this universe allows processes to occur, allows processes within our bodies to occur when there's a balance between yin and yang. Even when there's an imbalance, the qi can occur, but usually there will be some type of disruption, some type of stagnation. As you can see, qi can also be used to describe a process. Qi can be used to describe a phenomenon. For example, one of the key concepts in TCM is that stagnant qi causes pain. Chest pain can be caused by stagnant qi. Abdominal pain from bowel obstruction can be caused by stagnant qi. Blood, from a TCM perspective, includes both macrocirculation and the microcirculation. Blood functions to nourish and to moisten. So as you can see, blood is a yin substance. Now, we're not only talking about the red cell count here. Someone can actually have a normal hemoglobin and hematocrit test, and a TCM practitioner could actually assess for a blood deficiency. And the reason why is we're looking at all the fluids, including blood, that allow physiologic processes to occur. So when it comes to blood in general, it is referring to all the fluids that allow physiologic processes to occur, including neurotransmitters. So that's why in TCM, a blood deficiency can actually lead to instability of the psyche. Think of it as a way to describe there's an excess or deficiency of different neurotransmitters leading to bipolar disorder, leading to depression, and so forth. Another key concept in TCM is that stagnant blood also causes pain, just like stagnant qi. So when someone has a heart attack in the conventional medicine sense, it's basically a stagnant blood and a stagnant qi phenomenon happening at the same time. So the four descriptors we just talked about, the yin, yang, qi, and blood, those are pretty standard and basic TCM stuff. They're taught in school and anyone interested in TCM should know about them. Now we're going to dive into the heavy duty stuff. These are unconventional concepts developed by my father and I treating so many patients over the years and seeing correlations ignored by many others. Let's jump right into it. Here's the first concept. A healthy immune system is one that is neither underactive nor overactive. Now, it seems like this is actually pretty simple and straightforward, right? Wrong, because most people describe their immune system as either strong or weak, right? You hear this all the time. Oh, my immune system is so strong that I haven't had COVID yet. Or oh, my system is so weak that I always get sick all the time. When healthcare providers and patients describe the immune system as strong or weak, they are totally ignoring the variable of specificity. Let's say in our example, the person who said their immune system is so strong, they haven't had a COVID infection yet. If God forbid a totally new virus appears and produces a new pandemic, this person could easily be one that would succumb to this new virus, even though supposedly they have such a strong immune system. This new virus is basically able to exploit a natural vulnerability in this person's supposedly strong immune system. So as you can see, using strong or weak to describe someone's immune system is really not accurate at all. The supposedly strong immune system would completely fall apart if it's exposed to an infectious agent that is specific to its vulnerabilities. The opposite is also true. Let's take the extreme example of having the person that quote unquote gets sick all the time, but 
actually survives when this new virus wipes out 90% of the population. This person wouldn't seem to have a weak immune system anymore, wouldn't it? This person happens to not have the vulnerabilities that could be exploited by this new virus. So rather than saying someone's immune system is weak or strong, we should be categorizing it as healthy or unhealthy, determined by whether there is any overactivity or underactivity. An overactive immune system is bad. An underactive one is just as bad also. Someone with an underactive immune system is not only more prone to infections, but actually also more prone to cancer. The link between the immune system and cancer is now being understood more by modern science. Note that even hundreds and hundreds of years ago, TCM already recognized that quote-unquote toxins, often analogous to viruses and their after effects, could cause significant damage to one's health in an immediate or in a delayed fashion. A clear example is the human papillomavirus, HPV, and cervical cancer in women. How about an overactive immune system? What's wrong with that? An overactive immune system is the reason why we have autoimmune diseases. When we have elements in our bodies attacking different parts of our own self. Autoimmune diseases include alopecia areata, ankylosing spondylitis, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, diabetes type 1, eczema, hyper and hypothyroidism, IgA nephropathy, lupus, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, ulcerative colitis, vitiligo, and many more. Autoimmune diseases afflict so many individuals all over the world, and in fact, it's accelerating in occurrence and frequency. So many things can cause the immune system to be overactive, and we will discuss one of the most common causes later in this podcast. One thing to also note is that an overactive immune system causes a lot of inflammation. Inflammation causes pain and damage to the tissues in our bodies. Think of it like whatever the element is raging a war against an infectious agent, there is bound to be some collateral damage. If it's fighting off a bacteria trying to cause a pneumonia and we are able to survive it, then a little bit of collateral damage as a consequence would be expected and tolerated. This collateral damage could be in the form of decreased lung function, for example. The ability to tolerate this collateral damage decreases with increasing age. That's why pneumonia is such a significant cause of death in the elderly. But what if the immune system is directed to our own healthy tissues? Well, not only do we get the direct destruction to our healthy tissues, but we also get all the collateral damage on top of that. That's a double whammy. We are now going to transition to the second concept. This one is quite important. Infections often sensitize the immune system. Infections, whether viral or bacterial, alter the body. Many of these alterations can be permanent if no interventions are taken. Many of these alterations sensitize the immune system. Think about it. When we get vaccines, aren't we sensitizing our immune system? We are triggering a memory effect to occur so that when we are subjected to the real pathogens represented by the vaccines, our immune system can ramp up quicker to deal with the infection, increasing our chances of survival. The most recent example, the COVID vaccines. Without them, it would have taken us a lot longer to emerge from the pandemic, and many more lives would have been lost. So vaccines create alterations in our bodies, and these alterations sensitize our immune system. It is done for the good so we can survive an infection or have less damage from an infection. Natural infections from viruses and bacteria also create alterations in our bodies. But unlike the vaccines, what if these alterations do not benefit our health in the short term or in the long term? Now, there's a lot of controversy regarding whether or not vaccines can leave quote unquote bad alterations in our bodies, and we can discuss that in a future episode. For now, we need to understand well that natural infections, 
more often than not, cause changes in our bodies that are damaging in nature. Another key point we need to know also is that whether the immune system gets sensitized and to what degree is an interplay between genetics and the environment. Because this is a deep and complex concept to grasp, let me use an example. Let's say we have a pair of identical twins. They are obviously identical genetically, but let's say one lived in Asia and the other lived in the United States soon after birth. This is a perfect example to illustrate how the environment exerts significant control over the expression of the genes in each of the twins. The environment is inclusive from the physical to the social aspects. The physical aspects include the weather, the food, the natural habitat, etc. The social aspects include the parental upbringing, the social economic status, the educational system, etc. All these different things affect how the genes are expressed in this pair of identical twins. Furthermore, genetics play a heavy role in the function of the immune system. So you probably guessed by now what I'm going to say next. Because the pair of twins lived and grew up in substantially different environments, their immune system is very different despite having identical genes. One of these differences, among many others, is the susceptibility to get sensitized by infections and to what degree the sensitization occurs in their immune system. We can also say that even the types of alterations caused by the sensitized immune systems could be substantially different. We are now going to transition to the third and last concept for background knowledge before we go into a full discussion regarding my experiences with treating COVID and post-COVID patients. This third concept is sensitization leads to after effects. What does that mean? It means that even after an infection is over, the damage can be far from over. Often, the damage is subtle or asymptomatic at first. You could have suffered from the flu and after seven to 10 days, feeling a lot better. Let's say you're two weeks out, no more fever, no more body aches, no more sore throat, no more cough, no more congestion. You think you're healed from the flu infection, right? Wrong. The point I want to get across here is that even after all the obvious symptoms of an infection are over, there are often damages left behind and these damages can remain dormant until a trigger, often environmental, comes along. Another possible trigger could also be the genetic time clock. What form do these damages come in? By what mechanism? I am confident to say that it is in the form of autoantibodies. In modern science, we are now starting to gain a better understanding and appreciation of the importance of autoantibodies. By definition, these are antibodies that specifically react with self-antigens. They have the unfortunate role of mistakenly targeting and reacting with a person's own tissues and organs, usually in a really, really bad way, causing a lot of damage. Another important piece of information to note is that the characteristics of these after effects caused by these autoantibodies are also determined by an interplay between the genetics and the environment. So just like the identical twin example earlier, if both of them happen to get the exact same infection, their outcomes, weeks, months, and even years down the road could be very different. And when we are talking about outcomes, we're not talking about the immediate obvious symptoms. We're talking about whether long-term effects, some type of debilitating disorder could occur and to what degree. A very interesting example is how the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, responsible for mono, also known as the kissing disease, but formerly it's infectious mononucleosis, how it is tied to the development of multiple sclerosis even years down the road. We have now discussed four basic TCM descriptors, and the three important innovative concepts by which future scientific research can base out of to develop novel therapies and preventative measures for addressing infections and reducing the burden of autoimmune diseases on Earth. 
This concludes part one of the series, and this should be able to give you the necessary background to understand the intricacies of my clinical experiences dealing with COVID and post-COVID patients. In part two, we will go right into the real clinical scenarios and see what we can learn from them. I invite you to step out of the box and look at all aspects in your daily life never addressed before, because the answer you've been searching for could literally be right in front of you. With what you learn from my podcasts, you will develop the knowledge and the courage to face those health dilemmas and be the best version of you. Please subscribe and let me know what you would like to learn about, and I will do my best to provide you with the most practical and original content from all my experiences. Know that faith and fate are powerful, but you choose your destiny. Until next time.